so excited to uh, to welcome our presenters, Joe and Jason, and our ambassadors, um, Andrea and Denise, today to uh, to explore um, the starting with gender equity in mind presentation that is part of uh, our summer learning series conversations. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take a few minutes to uh, to do a little land acknowledgement. Um, thank you. Ophia's work takes place on traditional Indigenous territories all across Ontario. And we are grateful for the opportunity to meet and work on these territories and recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land. Uh, so as I noted, this is part of a four-part learning series. Uh, so on Monday, for those of you who had the opportunity to join us, we uh, had a conversation about social and emotional learning uh, and doing some rethinking and reimagining there. And today we are starting with gender equity in mind. Uh, next week, we are taking a, a break, but we'll be back um, the week of August 30th. And so on Monday, we are having a conversation about truth and reconciliation. And we are having another discussion on Tuesday around shifting the narrative in health and physical education towards action. And so we have a number of awesome panelists there looking really to apply some of the key concepts that we've explored um, in these first three presentations. I wanted to contextualize this learning series a little bit uh, for you. Um, and for those of you who may or may not know, uh, this year is OFIA's 100th anniversary. And 100 years ago, uh, the idea of OFIA was born out of a collective feeling of optimism and necessity as the world emerged from a global pandemic, the Spanish flu pandemic. And you may or may not know, but educational institutions really played a, a pivotal role in curbing the spread of the pandemic at the time and health and physical education was regarded um, and quoted as the most effective single weapon with which to combat influenza and other communicable diseases. So it's kind of interesting that we've come full circle 100 years later uh, celebrating our centennial. So the idea that children and youth are able to gain the knowledge and skill to lead healthy, active lives is as important now <clears throat> as it was then. And since 1921, OFIA's mandate has focused on providing quality curriculum and classroom supports to teachers to increase their confidence in supporting healthy, active living education in multiple environments. When health and physical education programs are delivered in healthy schools and supported by staff, families, and communities, learning is most effective. We know this um, and is the best way to support children and youth in making healthy and safe choices. However, um, those students can learn a great deal about respect for themselves and the differences in each other in health and phys ed. Health and phys ed has also played a historic role in Canada's colonialism, and it is implicated in harm and in racist and oppressive behaviors within the education system. So the concepts of equity, diversity, and inclusion are central to the implementation of health and physical education. And by understanding the collective history that h and -E has played, um, we can begin to unravel this whole subject area and better understand how it can contribute to reconciliation and achieve the goals of respecting and celebrating diversity. And so we're so grateful to have you here to be a part of that discussion today, because where we go from here and how we shift that narrative is really up to all of us. Um, so thank you for being here. So I'm about to hand it over, folks. I'm so, so, so excited and humbled to have Jason Trin, Joe Tong, Denise Bell, and Andrea Hakeley joining us uh, to present to you today. Jason Trin is a coordinator of Global Competency STEM Information Computer Technology for the TDSB. And in this role, Jason designs professional learning experiences to support all educators to transform their teaching practice and impact their students' learning. He's a Google certified innovator, Apple distinguished educator, and is the recipient of the Ontario Premier's Award for Teaching Excellence, as well as the ISTE Digital Equity Award. Jason shares his passion for education, creativity, and equity as a speaker facilitator at events throughout North America, and as a contributing author creator in a variety of publications and social media platforms. Please visit jasontries.com, and we'll put that in the chat for you in a sec, to learn more about his work. Joe Heave is a teacher in the Richmond District School Board in British Columbia, a sessional instructor at, the UB, at UBC, and for the past three years, he has been an adjunct teaching professor at the University of British Columbia, focusing on teacher inquiry and home economics education. Joe was part of UBC's SOGI, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Advisory Committee. Joe is an Apple Distinguished Educator as well, and recently released a queer terminology Instagram series through at Creative Station. We'll also put that in the chat for you. Connect, Joe, connect with Joe through social media at, at Teacher Tong on Instagram and Twitter. Andrea is currently seconded as an h and curriculum consultant to OPIA. And she has been a part of many regional and provincial initiatives that support the HP curriculum, healthy schools, and also the DPA policy. 
She's a strong advocate for people with disabilities and has spoken at professional learning networks such as the Hospital for Sick Kids, Holland Floorview Kids Rehab Hospital, Jumpstart Charities, and Autism Ontario. She uses she, her, and hers pronouns and asks others to use these pronouns in reference to her. And last but not least, Denise Bell. Denise is a health and physical education teacher with the Peel District School Board. She's currently pursuing a master's in kinesiology with an emphasis on equity in sport and has been a part of a number of initiatives and developments for the advancement of sport for all. She's currently focused on decolonizing fitness and researching ways to support anti-racism in sport and is an LGBTQ2S plus advocate. She uses she, her, and they, them pronouns. So welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to hand it over to our presenters. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so, so thrilled uh, to be with all of you today uh, for starting with gender equity in mind. We're going to have lots of conversations today, um, lots of food for thought. Um, and really come at this from where you are right now. Um, that's my biggest uh, piece of advice as we move on today. So a little introductions. Uh, thank you so much, Tammy, for the fantastic introduction uh, of, of all of us. Uh, just give you a little bit of geographical sort of where, where, where I'm coming from. I think Jason is, is uh, over on, on, on most of your ends. Um, but my name is Joe Tong, going by he, they. Um, and I'm all the way on the West Coast um, in beautiful uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, um, and the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, and I'll throw it over to Jason to do a quick little intro. Hi, everybody. I'm an educator from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I'm uh, um, a part, uh, on the lands of Treaty 13, also known as Toronto Purchase, hosted on the lands in the sagas and the credit, uh, of the Nation of A and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And I shared a link here as well for you to find out what treaties and territories that you're on. And one of the works that Joe and I are really focusing in on to make you know, the land knowledgeable, actionable, is really looking at the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And as we begin this new school year, those are calls to actions that are, that, that are verbs, right? They're actions that we can look at as educators to really just begin to look at our learning spaces and see this work through. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so I always start things, and, and some people say it's the West Coast thing, but I always start things with an invitation. Um, and everything that we're going to be talking about today, I want you to take from sort of an introspection lens first. Uh, as we're going through some maybe new to you terminology or maybe terminology that you've been accustomed to, to, to using in your personal and, and professional practices, um, think about just what you've been taught about these concepts growing up and also now and what you're doing to learn and unlearn certain things. So, you know, we'll be talking a lot about, you know, what it means to be feminine, masculine, behaviors that are normalized for both and um, maybe different concepts that we see as being colonial and, and what that means for us moving forward as, as teachers. Uh, I want you to contemplate how you feel about the questions that come up the provocations that will show as well as some of the, the the terminology but most importantly when you do feel maybe a little dissonance that that's okay that's good it should happen um, but also step back and kind of go why so why is it that I like I find some of the the conversations or some of the the the, the, the visuals or the terminology a little jarring or a little uncomfortable um, that's totally okay and if, and you know what on the other side if you feel super thrilled and excited that we're we're finally talking about this also feel free to to exclaim as well because that's always nice to celebrate a lot of the the, the movements and the forward motion that that we're having especially with gender equity um, so sit in all the feelings as much as possible um, and always think about, you know, there's going to be lots of opportunities to unmute yourself, to be part of the conversation. Um, but I know for myself too, acknowledging, you know, I, even though I do go by he, they pronouns and, and, and there's parts of me that are, that are, that are cis, um, cis male, there are parts of me that identify as gender fluid. And so being able to know that on the outside, I do have cis male privilege and realizing that for myself I would like you to think about your positionality today so if you feel like you need to unmute yourself or say something in the chat think about where it's coming from think about um, who you're centering in the conversation as well and that's something that we want to be uh, thoughtful about as we move on and uh, in, into our practices so final thing today we're not here to tell you what you have to do in your classrooms right we're not saying this is where and this is how you can be a good person. That's absolutely not where we're going with this. But it really is that invitation to have a starting point, maybe one reason 
that that you have from today to reevaluate and maybe move forward towards equitable spaces and practices. Okay. Hopefully that sounds good. For interacting with us, um, I would love for you to use reactions. That's one of my one of my favorite things because I look over when I'm sharing my screen and see this little like grid of people. If you want to use those reactions, give a little clap or a thumbs up or a thumbs down or whatever it may be, then I th then it helps us when we're looking at all the little squares to know that people are there. <laughs> as, as some of you know, when you're teaching online, sometimes you just want something and they're like, "Hello, am I getting through?" Um, and also use the chat as well. There's going to be lots of time to use the chat. Um, uh, today as we're asking some food for thought sort of questions and we invite you to um, throw any ideas there. There's no judgment, but there is a lot of connection that we want to have here. So, so there we go. All right. So we're going to start things off by really stepping back and looking um, not, you know, not like throwing ourselves right into the terminology and all that, but just generally even the title of the session. So what I invite you to do right now is in the chat, this is your first time to sort of engage with us. Um, to think about what is equity to you and what that definition may be for you and especially in, your, in the different roles that you may hold, uh, your different perspectives that you may have based on your different identities, what do you see equity as being? So some replies are starting to come in. Um, somebody sharing about each person getting what they need to be successful and feel good about themselves. Uh, people sharing about being mindful of, um, right? It's getting going really fast for me. Uh, being mindful of, of how students see awesome. themselves as part of the larger community. Uh, each individual is honored, respected, and has or is given what they need at any given moment. Equity means whoever has a voice in the community can do anything, including. Uh, including abuse, abuse people. This is what I have to learn. So I think looking at marginalized folks, how people are, um, the impact of our actions, uh, opportunities for all, representation, uh, respect, love, kindness, supporting, learning and sharing, um, seeing ourselves in a space, belonging, uh, being partial to individual differences, uh, taking steps to make sure folks are seen, heard and valued in ways that supports their growth and development. Um, so I'm hearing really it's a, really dealing with humanity, dealing with people is, is a common through line I'm hearing and a lot of the responses that people are sharing. So thank you very much, everybody for sharing, uh, being seen and heard, giving a voice, space, opportunity um, to those marginalized. Um, you know, so th there is really, I think a lot of people are in minds of looking at being people-centered. And I think we think you need to think of equity in terms of our, ourselves or as colleagues, all the stakeholders in education, both our students, um, creating opportunities and removing for all and removing barriers. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I think. Thank you. Yeah, Joe, I'll pass, yeah. it, pass it to you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I love all the themes that are coming through. And these are, I, I think, good jumping points for us later on when we have a little more of a casual conversation um, among the four of us. Uh, and, and I think seeing that, that, um, that, that theme come through about representation and opportunity. I think that's that's really connecting with my own definition of equity, um, especially you know with the different identities that I hold, um, and also being real and, and also realizing that really it's beyond this idea of diversity and inclusion, right? It's not it's not just like being like okay, this these, we're just going to lump all the people together, or you know this is who makes up our space, but actually realizing what specific identities um, can bring to the table, what the gifts are, and being able to give equal access opportunities and advancement, which is a big thing, I think, especially when we're talking about system leaders, that kind of who, who is able to um, raise to, to, to different positions of power, that's also a really big part of it. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it's when our identities don't determine our outcomes. I think that's the biggest thing for me is based on who I am, does that already sort of say that I can't get certain things because of who I am or, or, or because of the different identities you hold? And for me, that's what equity 
um, starts to, and especially gender equity, starts to 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 to, to push. Um, yeah. So. Thank you, thank you for all the definitions. I'm gonna throw one resource here, and this is sort of the way that we're going to be um, giving resources and sort of uh, all that to you today. You'll see usually some sort of QR code at the bottom right of your screen. So you can scan that now. And if you you find like, ah, like I'm not fast enough, it's totally okay, because we actually have it all compiled at the very end of today's session as well, um, as well as you'll be getting all of these slides. Um, so don't worry if you don't scan something quick enough or if it's too small on your screen, there's lots of opportunity. So the first resource that I'm going to share with you all is the ADL Glossary. And this is uh, stands for Anti-Defamation League. Um, it's a publication out of the United States, but it kind of breaks down terminolo uh, ter terminology into sort of digestible chunks, especially general terminology that we throw around today. So obviously we're gonna be looking at gender equity a little bit later. But there's some general um, terms like bias and discrimination that Jason will talk about too, and equity, equality, all those sort of big picture sorts of definitions are really broken down really nicely in this resource. The other thing that I love about this for, um, for teachers is that they have educator as well as elementary level definitions as well. So if you're finding it like, oh my gosh, how do I start this conversation with, with K to threes um, or, or younger folks, this is a great resource to start to have some of those conversations um, at, um, at, at different grades, okay? So that's, that's layer, that layer. So we're gonna add this next layer now of gender. And we're gonna do a little bit of today, a looking back, looking forward with everything. So we're gonna look back at sort of ourselves because at the end of the day, we teach who we are and that's, that's just a part of teaching. Um, so thoughts for, for, for all of you to drop into the chat. Let's add that layer of gender onto this. In what ways did or do we learn about gender in our lives? So throw some of your ideas into there. They can be teaching specific or they may be our experience and, and maybe childhood specific for you. What are some ways or maybe some locations um, that you learned about gender? Yeah, things that we see here, toys. And, and I think just as we talked about, you know, having representation before when it comes to equity, also thinking about what is represented, what is normalized. And, and these are those ways that a lot of times we experience that in language, especially awesome. Thank you for, 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 for that layer. Yeah, and, and language is a really interesting one to me, especially um, as, as we think about what types of language we use to describe male presenting students or different skills that we think male presenting students should have versus female presenting students. So lots of nuances there. Events in the city, newspaper, how the physical spaces are built. I can't wait for you to unpack that one later, Andrea. Um, books, videos, media in general. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. So I think a lot of, you know, we're starting to get to, you know, a lot of these experiences aren't things that we learned in teacher's college, right? Or in, in university. These are things that we experience as people growing up as human beings with, um, with, with parent guardians, with people around us, different, depending on our social spaces, where we grew up geographically. There's so much that lends itself to how we normalize maybe our language or the ways that we see students um, and how, and the different assumptions that we can make. Right. And so for today, it's thinking about looking back at all of that and looking at why it may be um, easy or difficult or why there may be some discomfort to move towards um, a lot of the different steps that we'll talk about with um, gender identity. Um, so as we continue today, have another one of these nuggets in your mind, these questions in your mind, we're just thinking about how our past experiences show up in our practices. We're going to talk a lot about practices. We're going to talk a lot about um, sort of terminology. So for all of you to think about, okay, like what is it in my past that's allowing me to see or um, understand what's in front of me? So we're gonna throw it over to an example now. So Jason's gonna take it away and, and uh, look at a current example that some of you may have seen in the news recently. So girls are underdressed compared to the boys. Clothing is much more revealing. Um, what are the uniforms so different for what they assume that the same sport? So it is the same sport as both handball. Um, Tammy wants to know, understand more about why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Heidi, that's a great opportunity, uh, provocation about asking, was it their choice? Are we able to provide choice for people to, to wear what they feel most comfortable that they can compete in uh, that makes them feel comfortable? Yeah, and Lee's brought up actually, even like physically in the photo that the male presenting and female presenting individuals are split up on the, um, in the photo itself. 
Yeah, so Rebecca's asking in terms of their identity. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, in the Olympics, uh, similar to the athletics that we run as co-curriculars or within high school secondary settings, we have male and female phys ed. uh, The competition is gendered. Um, so in terms of their identity, I'm not, I, I can't speak to that, but they are in gendered by structure in terms of how they compete, how they compete. Yeah. So in terms of like, uh, uh, the competition, like is the choice of uniform equal on both sides. So is somebody who is on the women's team able to wear the tank top and, and shorts and vice versa. So I think a, a lot of this can be extended. I think a lot of people have noticed the same things and are wondering the same things. Um, and I think this is a great provocation to think about our learning spaces. And we're hoping to, we're gonna dive into this. This is, a, this is meant as a minds on to help you start thinking about seeing gender identity, gender expression, seeing inequities or discrimination that may, may, may be occurring. Um, so I'm glad that a lot of you are, are with us on the same page. You're being able to see that there is a stark difference in terms of noticing and wondering specific things. So thank you for that. And I, I, I do want to add here what Melissa is saying about like who is deciding these decisions. Uh, similar to within our spaces, uh, who is deciding uh, what's happening on males and female sides, or even who deciding is what is categorized as female, what is categorized as male. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, I know as I turn this over to me and I'm just like going through the comments because they are just incredible. Everyone, thank you for bringing up so many different um, aspects to this conversation beyond the, the, you know, what we physically see. There's a lot of conversations even around, um, you know, what the experience is for the individuals in this photo. And I think that's something that we're going to get to, especially as we start, as we start to unpack some of the terminology um, that I want to differentiate and, and, and I want to unpack today. So. The next section is just going through as much of the terminology as, as possible. And there are certain things that I really want to hit home for, for, for all of us today um, so that we're having as much of the same conversation as possible in terms of our understanding about um, what these different what, what different terms are that we may be using. Um, so the four that we're going to unpack today together are sex assigned at birth, um, which is um, a preferred way right now um, of talking about what we used to call sex. Um, or what we used to what we used to call biological sex. A lot of the times, what um, it's it's a much better way to kind of say, you know, this was the sex that you were assigned at birth, um, so that it sort of opens space to be able to talk about the conversation around gender. Okay, the second is gender identity, uh, and how it, someone experiences gender, gender expression. Okay? You can already see in some of these uh, the, these words that it's you know, and this is sort of like outward expression of gender, um, and then sexual orientation which is sort of the, the uh, romantic or aromantic um, uh, uh, perspectives that, that someone may have. Okay. And so we're gonna unpack these, um, these four, um, but before I do sort of move on with these four, what I do need to talk about first is colonialism and gender. Uh, a lot of the times I think people are like, oh, this is something that we have to understand now and, and, and all of that, but especially in, in Canada, when we look at the a lot of the terminology uh, that, that, that we um, that we face in, in in the queer community, a lot of that is colonial terminology. Um, these were terms that uh, we we had to sort of come up with so that we could start to move past a lot of the um, harm that was done to erase gender fluidity um, in indigenous communities, um, erase two spirit um, identities in in, uh, in in indigenous communities. So being mindful that we are going to be using these terms today, but at the same time, we want to also be able to acknowledge the fact that um, when it came to colonialism and the like, the erasure of of, of certain identities. Um, colonialism really brought in gen- the, gen- the gender binary, heteronormativity, patriarchy, all of that you- that you'll see um, us moving beyond as much as possible here. Um, so on the left, you'll see a little excerpt from the Teaching from Gay to Z um, a series that, that, that we just released through at Creative Station. There's a QR code for it at the bottom right. Uh, I basically go through um, in, I think it's 20 something odd days, different nuances to queer terminology. And so everything that's unpacked, including these four, um, and and please check it out because that's where I think there's lots of provoking questions for us to unpack each one of these when it comes to our practice, right? So that's there for all of you and, and it's also gonna be shared later on as well. 
So the first, um, the first sort of do not get these too confused sort of conversation is sex assigned at birth versus gender identity. And th this is where I want to kind of flat out say sex assigned at birth does not trump gender identity. Sex assigned at birth does not equal gender identity. These are very, very different conversations. But sex assigned at birth a lot of the times is how, um, how students may show up when it comes to our attendance list or whatever it may be, but their gender identity um, in, in terms of how they experience gender, that is what's most important. And that's what's going to help us sort of bridge those relationships and honor where the students are at with their gender identity. So thinking about that when it comes to the different, um, the different ways to push towards gender equity, um, it's really important that we identify um, for ourselves why we may need to know someone's sex assigned at birth versus introduce ourselves at the very beginning of the year with our pronouns, allow students to do the same if they choose. And so that's that conversation that we want to have um, right off the bat, okay? That these, are, that these two are not the same. So a little bit of food for thought for you. You don't have to put it in the chat. If you wish to, you can. Uh, but think about how sex and gender are expressed in our classroom and school structures. Okay, so I talked a little bit about that in terms of the data that's kind of portrayed or thrown out there when it comes to our, our, our school systems um, and the way that we maybe segregate different classes, maybe course signups, all of that. So if you have any more ideas, throw them in the chat if you want to, if it's on your mind. Um, but that's more for sort of a pondering of in my certain situation, how do I see sex and gender expressed? Okay, we're going to move on to the next one, which is a three parter. So realizing that gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation are not the same thing. There's a lot of assumptions that people make in terms of, you know, when someone identifies um, as uh, when someone identifies as female, that they may have a certain gender expression. They should look a certain way, and that they should have some sort of sexual orient uh, this, a certain sexual orientation that's sort of prescribed to them. This is where we start to run into some troubles in the way that we may talk to students. Um, and even, you know, you can think about that in childhood too, right? The, the way that we gender, but also the way that we, we talk about sexual orientation with our students, or, or not students, but maybe children without knowing it. So when we're like, oh, is that your girlfriend or is that your boyfriend? When we talk to specific um, gen, uh, male or, or female presenting children, that's something that we want to sort of move away from. So realizing that the way that someone identifies and the way that someone expresses their gender does not determine sort of what their, their their sexual orientation is, okay? So identity being the person's internal and individual experience of gender. And this is where, you know, uh, I'm talking about um, the question from Samir that came up with gender fluidity, right? Gender identity doesn't mean that you're looking at two different camps and you have to choose. Gen gender identity is a huge spectrum. It's this idea of, you know, the, the depending on where a person is at in their life, they may identify in all ends of the spectrum. Um, and that really is their experience. So it's not about us kind of looking at someone and needing to know their gender identity. Because at the very end of the day, you have to think to yourself, why do I feel like I need to know this? Why do I feel like I need to have this piece of information? And then thinking about, do I need to know it so that I can treat them in a specific way? And why do I feel like I need to treat them in a certain way if I know this piece of information, right? Similarly, gender expression is how a person publicly presents their gender, right? So this isn't just dress. This isn't just the way that, you know, we, we put different clothes on our body or the way that we comb our hair. It's everything to do with behavior, out, outward um, sort of uh, ways that, that, that people talk. I know this, and, and this is something that I, that I grew up sort of finding out for myself in terms of my gender expression, um, especially the code switching that I had to do. And the way that I present right now to all of you in sort of this like, this sort of like peaceful, calm centered way is not the way that I am with my friends, right? I actually, like when I'm talking to my friends, a lot of times I have a, a, a lot of different like effeminate qualities to the way that I, I talk. And that's part of kind of how I grew up and, and that's also part of who I am, right? So thinking about that and what does that mean in terms of how someone expresses their gender, do you kind of oh, like right off the bat want to know, oh, is this, it, it, does this person present as, as this or identify as this? And then stepping back and always going, why do I think I need to know that, right? And then the third is sexual orientation. So experience of sexual or romantic attraction to other people or no one. 
Okay, and that's really important. That last piece that I said, um, because we do need to have representation for aromantic folks as well and asexual folks, because that's one of the um, identities that has not been really um, centered um, in, in a lot of different um, in a lot of different uh, queer spaces as well. Okay, so thinking about these three, looking at ourselves now in terms of what assumptions might we have. Or, or might we have made about someone's gender identity or sexual orientation based on their gender expression? Okay, so for, your, for yourselves, if you wanna throw some stuff in the chat or if you just wanna to think to yourself, um, thinking about sort of when, when have we had moments, maybe when we were really young, maybe yesterday, maybe, maybe this school year, um, where we started to allow these different aspects to blur into each other. Okay, or how we made assumptions based on one or the other. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and Christine's put it in there, assuming pronouns. I think a lot of the times that's, that's really difficult um, for, for a lot of folks because it is something that's been normalized in society is to, to be able to look at someone the way that they express their, their, their gender and automatically say, oh, that's a male presenting person. So they must identify in this way, right? And so catching ourselves and using gender neutral pronouns as much as possible, um, especially with kids, I would say, um, using they, them pronouns, unless you know and you've had explicit sort of instruction from them that they want, they really prefer and would be respected to be called by a specific um, pronoun. Right? Misgendering, misuse of pronouns for sure is in there as well. And definitely, Andrea, I think when it comes to um, you know, assuming the impact, how we teach and build relationships with our students, it does start off with seeing them as how they want to be presented and how they want you to interact with them. And constant misgendering or anything like that in certain spaces is actually probably the number one, I would say right away, you're going to have students shut down right away, right? Or people that, 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 that you interact with. Right? Assuming role expectations, huge there too, um, in so many different ways. Um, thinking about, you know, what jobs or what roles we want male presenting students to play in our classrooms, as well as female presenting students in our classrooms. As a design teacher and, and home economics family studies teacher, when I'm working with, you know, 24 different students in, um, in, in all these different kitchens um, and looking at, you know, who's doing what type of work in that sort of kitchen space, a lot of times that's something that comes up for me as well is kind of going, okay, I noticed that these are some biases maybe from home or maybe from the conversations that are appearing in the, the, the division of labor um, within certain group settings, right? So think about that also for your own classrooms as well. Um, how does, what does the division of labor look like based on perceived gender identity, okay? Males uh, with what we call feminine expressions and assuming their sexual orientation is male, I, I, exactly, right? Um, there's this expectation and, and thinking about the layer of, um, sort of uh, male dominated macho culture, I would say in certain spaces and what it means if you don't fit into that um, and what it means for um, a lot of the ways that people are teased as well, right? What, where did they go first? A lot of times it's some sort of dig at sexual orientation, right? So, th so think about how those types of interactions appear in, in your spaces. Thanks everyone. So one great visual, some of you may have seen this before, some of this may be new to some of you, uh, a great visual for this is the genderbred person. I've linked it at the bottom as well. It's in English and French. It's currently in its fourth, um, it's in this fourth version. Uh, and you'll see on the very left, it's a great way of visualizing sort of what, how all these different, um, how all these different concepts sort of come together in a person, right? So from the identity, how they see themselves, how they, how they experience the world to attraction, being in the heart. So they, do they have, romantic feelings for others or not, um, and who that may be. Sex being, um, you know, what they're assigned at birth based on body parts, um, and then also expression, how they decide they, they express, right? And at the end of the day, also realizing that all of this is fluid, right? The way that someone expresses their gender a lot of times is based on how they feel in certain situations. Um, the, the way that they talk, they might code switch in different situations. So thinking about that. The, the other layer that I'm going to put on this as well, and we talked a little bit about this um, when it came to gender fluidity, is that this is this person's experience. So the, the so we seeing this from the outside right now, this person, 
this little gender bred person. This belongs, these experiences belong to this person. They don't belong to us. We don't need to know all this information. If we feel like we need to, we need to ask ourselves why. And we need to empathize. We need to um, have as um, have as much uh, interactions and relationship building as possible so that we can really connect with people on a humanistic level versus sort of knowing identities first and then working from there. Okay. So some thoughts there. A question that I'll leave you all with as, educa as educational leaders, which all of you are, teachers are leaders, how might our understanding of these concepts help us address the many inequities and intersections in our school communities? Okay. So thinking about inequities um, that we've talked about already, a lot of you address so many, uh, so many of them, so thank you, but also the intersections of this as well. Right. So by intersections, we mean that, you know, we can sort of take apart just one aspect of someone's identity and treat them in that certain way. Uh, and that's where you start to fall into stereotypes and, you know, sort of roles and, 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 and rituals and all this kind of stuff that, that we think we need to do for specific people. Um, so when they, when they start to intersect, when, we, when people start to have more than one of these identities, how do we address um, equity in that sense, right? And I think um, a lot of e um, empathy building and a lot of that will come up as well. One thing, Joe, I want to jump in here just to really amplify is mm -hmm. that, that with sex assigned at birth, it's not as clear cut as, as male and female. Uh, there's something known as the gender binary mm -hmm. where there's just the thought of male and female. Um, uh, but really, it is a spectrum. Uh, even there, there are folks who are intersex, which meaning that they may uh, have both male and female genitalia. There are trisomies of the sex chromosomes, maybe. So it's not a clear cut of saying XX chromosomes, XY chromosomes. There's trisomy, which means that you have three chromosomes of multiple XXY, for example. Um, so sex assigned to birth, the word assigned is key, is where uh, somebody has put that label on you, on your documentation. Whereas what Joe has spoken about is that the identity of your, your sexual orientation, your gender expression, your gender identity is on the individual who is, who is proclaiming that to, to the world. So even with sex assigned to birth, it is not as clear cut as male and female as one just to amplify that, that the gender binary doesn't sure. exist. Gender is, is a spectrum. Thank you, Jason, for sure. And uh, one more thing that I'll say about this before I throw it over to Jason to talk about you know, how this is policy, um, a lot of this, th this work, um, is you may have seen some different versions of this particular image. So you may have seen maybe robots or unicorns or different things like that. Um, in a lot of the, 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 the discourse right now, um, when, it comes to, um, when it comes to queer um, spaces, it's something that, that actually a lot of people don't really like when it comes to using sort of in like non-human entities to describe um, people who may have, you know, not, um, may have diverse um, gender identities, sexual orientations, and all of that. Um, so a lot of the times you'll see on on uh, gender neutral washrooms that they still are people that are there. And I think that's really important to, to say that anybody that goes into these, these spaces are human beings and that they're not unicorns and they're not robots, that they are human beings. So that's where some criticism is right now around sort of this, um, this cartoonification of of um, queer people. So that's something that I want to put out there as well. So think about what, what message that sends, right? Um, if you're using sort of non-human entities to describe that. So Jason, I'll let you take it away and then transition into policy. Perfect. I think that's a, that's a perfect segue because uh, at the end of the day, we're, all, we're talking about humans. We're, we're talking about humanity here. We're all people and we begin, begin to dehumanize uh, people based by using different representations, we forget that that there is protections and there is policies in place. Um, so on the next slide um, is where I want to bring up the Ontario Human Rights Code. Uh, no, a, li a little piece of light reading here, but under the Human Rights uh, Code, discrimination and harassment because of gender identity or gender expression is against the law. So this responsibility is beyond us being educators is us being human in terms of living in Ontario and, treat, and, and upholding human rights. So um, everyone should be able to have the same opportunities, benefits, and be treated with equal dignity and respect, including transgender, transsexual, intersex persons, and other people whose gender identity or expression is not, 
is or is uh, seen to be different from their uh, sex assigned at birth. Um, and in 2012, uh, gender identity and gender expression were added as grounds of discrimination. Um, so in terms of this policy, this, this supersedes your school board policy, your classroom routines, your school's routines. This is where we are, are, are called to do this. This is a professional moral duty for us to, to be active citizens within, within Ontario. And when I, when I speak about discrimination, I do want to spell it out. And it, it does echo uh, pieces of what Joe was sharing, where when, when we talk about gender identity, gender expression, it's not uh, for us to, to decide uh, if we are discriminating against somebody or not. So on the next slide here is another section from the, the Human, to, Human Rights Code, which defines discrimination as where it's a person who experiences negative treatment or impact, intentional or not. Um, so it really is focusing and centering on the person being harmed. Um, just like it's not for us to put labels on somebody's gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation, uh, it is focusing on the impact of our actions. So even if you did not intend to do it, or it was by accident or jokingly, um, discrimination counts where, where we are making a harmful and negative impact on that person's gender identity or or gender expression. Um, again, it can be direct, it can be obvious, as it says here, subtle or hidden, and there may be bigger pieces at play. And we do want, we do want to address that, that, that discrimination does happen. Uh, and, and for a variety of, uh, variety of reasons based on people's identity, and I want to just, just share that what, with gender identity and gender expression, now that is now covered. Um, so this hopefully is a piece where a lot of school boards are working actively to be able to change their policies to be reflective of the human rights code. Um, but today we want to give you some, some starting points to be able to think about uh, yourself, how you move through spaces, how you influence those stakeholders, those learners, those colleagues in your spaces to be able to begin this work ourselves uh, in, our, our, in our spaces that we have. So I, want, I do want to talk about levels of consideration where we can take a look at trying to action this human rights code when it refers to gender identity and gender expression. So in terms of these levels of consideration, I know there, as educators, we are, are we, we, there's a variety of stakeholders in edu education. And some people here may be system leaders. Um, so a question there in terms of considerations is what policies does your school board have uh, that will really support students um, with different gender identity and gender expressions. Uh, one thing that I can think of is looking at your names that are presented in terms of documentation. The Human Rights Code uh, sh shares that a student or a person is able to have their names on their documentation as, as they would like. Um, so somebody maybe who may be transitioning may have a dead name, a name that, that, that was assigned to them or given to them at birth, and they may have chosen a different name that they want to be called by. Does the documentation, uh, support that. So if in this Zoom call right now is the name being displayed was it automatic because you're signed in with your your your, your school board prof, uh, profile or was it were you re given the ability to rename yourself and actually have your name shared there. Uh, it, beyond Zoom calls it's looking at the documentation of your logins, your your report cards, your other documentation that, that might be seen. At the school level, um, we can think about our learning spaces at the, at the whole entire school. Are there all gender bathrooms? Uh, or gender neutral bathrooms that exist for both staff and students. Uh, in HPE world, like thinking about change rooms, uh, what's, what supports are there, dress code policies and how they are enforced and to whom they're enforced uh, uh, disproportionately to. So looking at the school level, there's considerations there that we can prevent discrimination from occurring. And lastly, as educators, uh, we, uh, we have our learning spaces. Thinking of your classroom routines, your instructional strategies. Um, are you greeting everybody as boys and girls and actually doing groupings with boys and girls separate, separated? Uh, looking at pronouns, uh, perpetuating normative stereotypes, um, such as like celebrating Mother's and Father's Days, assuming that's the family structure amongst every, every family. Uh, so those are things that we have control. And depending on your role in education, uh, and some of you may be involved in all that. There, there is an uh, overlap here as well, but there are different levels that we can act. And we all have the ability to support our students that are directly in front of us, being able to sort of consider how we are, are, are moving through those spaces. Um, another, way I wanna another thing I want to focus in on is looking at content. 
So as educators, we are entrusted with curriculum that we are going to be, you know, supporting our, our students with and teaching. Um, and with there is also a great opportunity beyond your classroom routines and structural strategies to hear content. And one framework I want to bring here, which is which you can use, is universal design for learning. So with universal Des design for learning, uh, it's also referred to as UDL. Um, Universal Design looks at creating spaces and instruction and activities that centers a uh, student's learning profile uh, and making experiences that are gonna be essential uh, for that student to be able to be successful, but it's gonna be beneficial to all. But I wanna use this framework with the equity uh, um, sort of mindset where we're designing learning now for students who have been marginalized uh, based on their, their social identities uh, by the system and structures that are at play. So how can we design and look at our curricular areas to be able to design things that are gonna be engaging, that are gonna be um, representat representative and allow students to actually fully participate and be themselves in their learning. Um, so here is a resource from the CAST website, uh, which we'll share at the end of our slide deck, that gives you three prompts to think about when thinking about your learning experiences that you're creating for your students. Um, so think about uh, how learners will engage within the lesson. Um, so that's looking at engagement. So in terms of, of you know, thinking about your curriculum, um, are we providing access to a variety of opportunities? Um, I know when watching the, the Olympics recently, I, I was able to watch some field hockey games. And I, I, and I think the first time I saw, a rec I saw field hockey in the Olympics, maybe it was the last set of games, I realized there was both male and female competitions. Um, in, in my high school experience uh, or, or, or schooling experience, uh, field hockey was never an option to be able to demonstrate a, a specific set of skills available to me. Um, thinking about the second prompt, thinking about how information is presented to learners, a uh, great opportunity there is looking at representation. Uh, are we reflecting our students' identities in the models, the media, the examples that we are sharing? Uh, again, with the Olympics, there was a news where there was a first set of trans athletes that competed in the Olympics this past year. Are we using those as ways that students can see themselves in the curriculum? Uh, in terms of action and expression, uh, how are we getting our students to demonstrate that they're learning? Is it solely based on sharing, sharing that peak performance that, 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 that really benefits specific students? Or are we looking at skill development, um, looking at the classroom policies and routines that we have? You know, in, in my experience, you know, shirts and skins was a regular thing that happened in my phys ed classroom. Uh, is, that, is that just perpetuating, uh, you know, harmful norms that, and not inclusive of all of our students? So UDL, again, is a framework that has been used in multiple spaces. Um, in thinking about gender identity and gender expression, having the equity mindset is key to be able to design experiences that are going to support, that are going to be essential for maybe some of your marginalized students based on those systems and structures, but beneficial to all. And um, if you look at the CAST website, they are working on an iteration of UDL where it is embedded in equity. And I think that is a lens that we want to approach because, again, the Ontario Human Rights Code speaks to all of us to act in, in, and to move through our spaces to prevent discrimination happening to anybody, our colleagues, and to our students. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jason. Now, what we want to do is um, just to open things up for the four of us. And, and if any of you want to join as well in this conversation, please do. Um, I would recommend putting up your hand um, using the, the, the put hand up feature, which I believe is somewhere <laughs> you, you'll hopefully see it, it like it, it's, in it it's in yeah. reactions it's in reactions for most perfect. of us yeah yeah <laughs> perfect um so please use that and then and then we'll uh, and, and then we'll uh, call on you which will be a lot easier i think or just throw your questions into the chat or any sort of thoughts that you have there um there's some questions that have come up already that i think are are, are a great starting point for for us to have a little bit of an unstructured coffee talk among the four of us, I would say right now, um, questions around gender fluidity. I, I, like I know that there was a question that 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 came up earlier about you know if someone is gender fluid or identifies as gender fluid, um, how do I recognize them as male or female? And that's something that um, I've sort of been navigating myself as as uh, someone who who does identify. A lot of the times, as a cis male, and and then at at, at at other points, I do feel like I'm gender fluid, and and I identify as gender fluid. Um, so you'll see that in reflected in my pronouns. And I think a lot of the times, it's all about ourselves, right? 
and th- and this is where I think we we're really going to be hitting that home today is is thinking about do uh, like as a queer person do I exist and do I express based on someone else needing to know yeah. who I am and how I identify it and all of that and I think that is um some of the ways that we can actually do more harm than good if we try to guess someone's identities and we try to put them into that gender binary, so the male or female. Um, so the idea of someone who has come out to you to say, I'm, I, I, I identify as non-binary or I identify as gender fluid. Um, and then for us, as, especially as educators, to say, okay, well, um, do you want me to, you know, to address you as male or female? That's actually problematic in itself. Um, and that is a, a, a version of misgendering as well, um, because that also misgendering is not a binary in itself as well. So we need to be really mindful of that. Um, and I think when, when it comes to that and, and, you, and then thinking about the parent conversation, which I know has come up in the chat as well, um, that, you know, when, when it comes to the relationships that you have with students in that moment, when they are in your classrooms, you take on the responsibilities of the parent. Right, you are their, their, their person in that situation. So if they come to you and and they say, you know, so like you, I would love, you know, like this is how I identify. This is maybe something that that us as teachers we may know that is a problem at home. There may be misgendering that's happening at home, or some gaslighting, or whatever it may be that's happening at home. It is still our, our our responsibility and talking about all the different policies that Jason, you know, addressed today as well. It is our responsibility to respect that student's pronouns and use them um, in in the way that um, that they prefer and that they want to and that they identify with. Right. And yes, there may be pushback, but that's also part of this um, part of gender um, equity. Right. Is that you will come at resistance, you will have um, some issues that come up. But at the end of the day, you have the policy behind you, you have hopefully your admin behind you as well. Um, and at the end of the day, you have the students like, at the center and they're, they're how you are creating the experience for them, okay? So I think that's a great way to start, start off some of the conversations um, uh, that we have today, some of the shifts, entry points that we may have this may, some of the questions that came up today may be our first foray into the gender equity and 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 gender identity conversation. So I'm really glad that all of you are 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 giving us some food for thought and some some issues that I know that you've addressed in your your practices. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're gonna throw a question out there to to the to all of us here. So what may those shifts or entry points been? Um, and was there a framework or or something like that 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 helped you sort of understand all of this? Um, I'll start off the conversation between us four. And again, like, please feel free to drop your questions or comments in the chat box. And between the four of us, we'll try our best to weave the answers into um, our replies. But um, I'd like to bookend what I'm going to talk about with um, kind of the mindset from what Royan's session on Monday, how he framed how we should be thinking and reflecting throughout our journey as educators. And um, a bit of background, like I've I've been teaching for 19 years. When I came into teaching, um, I I loved sports. I thrived in sports. I was your typical jock. um, And I I saw H&P as a place where you train athletes. You got to get them into a high performance. I I teach to those students, right? And obviously through those years, and especially the past year in my role here at Highgate, it's it's um I had the privilege to really acknowledge um my own privilege in terms of how I grew up, my education, my role as an educator, because that is a very privileged role too, right? Um, and also my personal experiences because I grew up in such an affluent family who gave me all these positive experiences participating in all these extracurricular activities and also being able-bodied I I never really had many challenges growing up right and then there's twofold where I remember when my second year second or third year of teaching there was a student who graduated from my school who came back to visit our school because 
um, they were in high school now. They came marching into the door after school, right after the bell rang, took off the pictures off of the wall. And he, she was screaming, I don't want, I don't want my picture up there. I'm not him anymore. Um, that's not who I identified as back then. And it was so new to our school staff of how dealing with gender identity. And this student was so angry and came in, coming back to our school saying, saying um, that he was demonized, ignored, discounted. And it kind of shook me because it, you think for a human, a little human to come to our school, to have that experience and to come back, to be able to share that in such a public way. And he was, she was so angry. I think it really helped me examine um, I guess how we see ourselves as educators and our own experiences and our role in terms of how we connect and build relationships with our students. And I know we had this chat last night between Dee, Joe, and Jason. Um, feel free to jump in. Like I, I, it's 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 so hard to articulate for me sometimes because it's it takes so much time and, and um, empathy to co-construct these spaces for all our learners, right? And, and to end that, I, I always go back to one of the fundamental principles in our curriculum, right? Physical and emotional safety is a precondition to effective learning. We should have that in all of our spaces, right? Absolutely, Andrea, thank you so much. And I think, you know, like the, like the fundamental sort of principle that you talked about too. I think we can even generalize that to it's like our why of teaching and like why we enter into this space and what our role is as well. Maybe I'll jump in just to respond to Andrea, like in terms of look at the shifts at entry points. Like for me, like being um, cisgendered um, and being being male, like it 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 it, it it's my shift to entry point really is being an educator and looking at the diversity of my students and making sure that I am, I'm safeguarding their well-being, both academically, but also physically, emotionally, and, 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 their, and mental well-being. Like as educators, we're entrusted, the education acts is that we are almost like their temporary, like their guardians for the time at, at the school hour. Uh, and this speaks to a lot of the questions about, about support, like, you know, supporting families uh, where maybe a child is, uh, is uh, gender non-conforming, non-binary, uh, transitioning, um, and the parents, um, that, that conversation hasn't happened with the parents. And I think we, uh, as educators, we all know we wear many, many hats, but I want to share that we're not alone in this. I have to, I've taught uh, transgender students where, where, where the parents were not supportive, uh, but we're safeguarding the students' well-being. So in the school environment, we are using their preferred name. And, and, and the Ontario Human Rights Code says, states that and, and protects those individuals regardless of age. They are, they are human, uh, but it is a complex issue and it's layered and it, there's no one solution to everything. And I think when we're working with families and pe we're working with people, it is beautifully complex and it, there's nuance matters. Um, and, but you're not alone, like in terms of supporting the students, it was a, a conversation with administrators, social workers, child youth workers, guidance counselors, there are many different stakeholders within your space, both in your space, but also within your school board that can help you support that student, that family. Um, and, and there are procedural things that somebody mentioned about report cards, you know, as an educator, you don't have control of what's being reported there, but school boards are moving towards this. Uh, within the TDSB, I'm fortunate to know that we have a human rights department that that is supporting how, looking at the human Ontario human rights code and being able to implement those policies within our own policies um, so just know that you are not alone in it and and it, there is no one solution to it because you need to know, know your students you need to know that family you need to know your your learning community you need to know the parent guardian caregivers and the, the dynamic there but we are a trusted base of the education act to safeguard our students well-being um so and, and not and not discriminating not causing more undue harm so i wish i could give you like this is the solution you have to approach any family that's you know deal uh, that has a student or a child in there you know that that is maybe gender non-conforming there isn't a solution to that um because nuance matters the words you use matters uh how you approach the situation matters and it and so so there are, you know, so there, there are things that we we all have been trained on, you know, in terms of, of, of supporting students. And this is gender identity is no, no different than looking at anti-black racism, looking at, you know, 
other forms of like anti-Semitism or what's happening, you know, anti-Islamophobia, like and all, all the things that we deal as educators, these are complex issues and we're not alone. Um, so I, I can't, I know there's been a lot of questions about that, but just know that if you're approaching those situations, reach out to your school leaders. Uh, OFIA as an organization is here to support as, as well. Um, but, but know that you're not alone in that, in that process. I'm going to jump off of that. Uh, I, saw, yeah. I saw a question in the chat box from Laura. And uh, Dee, if you don't mind, I'm going to push you on the spot. Uh, Laura's question says, would love to hear from others. What do you what do you do in your classrooms to ensure a safe, inclusive environment? Um, what action can we take as educators to ensure it is a safe space for all? Um, in planning um, for the previous session with uh, Royan on social emotional learning, and also as we the four of us prepped for this one, um, Dee and I had this conversation about um, how can we put it so simply and what is our learning goal for all of our participants in this room right now, right? And, and I think the biggest thing that I learned from Dee as we had our uh, private conversation was our, our language and our actions and, and how we take the time to listen and build those relationships with our students and our staff, right? How do your support staff feel safe in the same room as you when they come in to support those learners that, that need that extra help, right? Um, what is the vibe in your gymnasium when they come for physical education, when they take that first step in your room? And, and what are the expectations? Is, is it, are they inclusive expectations? Um, I don't know, Dee, if you, if you want to share on uh, that conversation. Sure. Uh, I wanted to uh, piggyback off of Jason and say to Christina again, just as he said, it's, it's contextual in nature because we are not a child's parent, but at the end of the day, um, our, our experiences also influence how we interact with others. And um, I had a principal tell me once, and my mother would say this to me as well, this is somebody else's child. And so it's not treat them how you would want to be treated, but it's almost treat them better in some ways, because there is something that you don't know. Uh, and are you going to take the time and the effort? So I, I think it's perhaps Nikki in the chat, I'm not sure. Empathy is a key word that we all brought up in our conversation as well. So you may not be able to have certain experiences, but if you take the time to um, imagine yourself in a situation, and that's how we teach a lot of things. We have female teachers who are teaching male students or how they represent about things that happen to their bodies. And so we are able to empathize and have these situations. Some people bleed every monthly. And people don't know what that experience is like, but yet you can say, oh, I feel like you're in pain. So very similar to some of the things that we're addressing with mental health, um, just because you can't see something that doesn't mean that it's not there and that person isn't feeling a certain way. Uh, so with that parent, um, I think doing the least amount of harm, because in some ways we are going to harm individuals and then it's how do we repair that harm? Um, and that experience, Christina, that you had with the student Part of the reason I think that they may have done that is the anonymity behind it, right? So you've provided this arm's length where they're not in a situation with a lot of other people and that was safe. So we can't always provide safe spaces, but we can provide a space for an individual to feel secure enough and brave enough that they can take a risk and the repercussion of that is not a negative thing. It's a positive um, perhaps life-changing thing for them. Uh, so that opportunity is, is pretty fantastic. But uh, yeah, I think when Andrea and I were talking about it, um, you know, she shared personally about her daughter and the perspective of being that jock. Um, and my pendulum swung because I do a little bit of um, external coaching and personal training and was finding my experiences with individuals who are transgender uh, I was making mistakes, right? So yes, I identify in this queer community, but it's just like being an individual who is black. <laughs> I don't speak for all black people. I don't speak for all queer people. Um, and I think the humility that comes with that allows us to be more open to making mistakes and then learning from mistakes and having communication uh, to grow as individuals and 
Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I think uh, what you brought up in terms of humility and empathy, I think the two need to go together. And that's part of my experience. I think working through a lot of these personally, but also professionally, um, thinking about the fact that it's not just about thinking about empathy as in I need to step into someone's shoes. I think that's like the the minimum when it comes to understanding what someone is going through. It's actually getting to know the whys about not only their experience, but your own experience so that you can sort of make some connections and do what you need to do um, to address your own biases. And that humility part, like that's where it comes into. It's going, you know what, this is the limitations of my experience. And even for me as a queer person, like knowing my limitations do not jump into some of the um, other identities that are in our community. And I, I also don't speak for everybody that identifies in the same way that I do. Um, so even if I, you know, um, I'm interacting or getting to know students that identify with a lot of the same identities that I do, I can't speak for their identity. I can't assume those things either. Um, and I think that's what we need to do as, as teachers, as leaders, um, is to kind of go, okay, this is what I need to not like add on to my vocabulary. I think that's, that's one sort of, uh, way of looking at the material from today in terms of an add-on that's not what this is it really is that sort of relearning but also re-narrating some of the things that we've talked talked to ourselves about about specific identities and that's been i think the internal shift that's needed to happen for me and in, in, in thinking about the different spaces that i'm taking up the different spaces that i'm creating for students um is that humility of going i don't know what i don't know about experiences that are beyond mine um and not and not sort of making assumptions right like it, it, at the end of the day that's the most difficult thing to do um it's where a lot of conflicts happen obviously um but that personal work that we'll that we'll talk about that needs to happen is so much more than sort of what you do sort of performatively in the classroom later on right pronouns are great all that stuff is great but do you fully know sort of from your experience and, and getting to know folks with other identities, why it is that that is so important, like what it means to feel misgendered, what it means to have assumptions made of you that may be preventing you from succeeding. Right? Those are things that I think we need to, to, to think about and get to that human experience. Right? Yeah, and as Christine says here, like a lot of learning and unlearning. Um, that's, I think, definitely the last year um, with a lot of social movements that have happened. That's something that, that, that a lot of us are starting to, to realize and then thinking about now, how do we bring that into the educational sort of sphere, right? Jason? Yeah, I want to just uh, go back to Laura's question about just like how, uh, just about what, what do you, how do you ensure that in your classroom? And I think we need to look at the most marginalized in your in your space. You look to the students that are not, you know, your your that are not going to be, uh, you know, in your co curriculars leading that. You know, often my my own experience with, with uh, physical health education is where it was not a space for me. Like it was not designed because I was not very coordinated. I was, I, I was, I'm a science and math teacher and I know there's stereotypes that go with that. Uh, but, but that's what I leaned into. That's where I felt like I was a safe space for me. And uh, so I think we need to look into our spaces um, and look to the most marginalized there, design experiences from there. Um, you know, are we looking at solely based on performance as the only way that you're measuring success? Uh, is there spaces where, you know, I know, especially with a health and physical education, you're requiring students to to be physically present and 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 connect with their bodies. And a lot of students, and, and being a secondary in secondary lens, there is a lot of uh, challenges and a lot of thoughts and considerations when trying to get folks who are just learning about their bodies and as their bodies are changing to be able to use those bodies in a specific way. Um, one story I have is that when I was teaching, I, I, uh, I was doing a science lesson in the hallway and I saw somebody leave the gym, uh, a male student, a male, um, male presenting student uh, leave a, a class and he was crying in, in the stairwell. Um, and I, I went over to the, the teacher, I, I noticed this and said, hey, hey did, you re did you realize that a student had left your class and he, and he didn't because I think it was he was maybe focused on more of a traditional setting where he was looking at just at the, the performance of, of, of a specific skill in the sport. Uh, and, and then once I know once I, I notified him if he did go over and, and, and speak to the student, but I, I questioned like in terms of, of that space, that student didn't feel comfortable to be able to express uh, what they were going through, uh, you know, and, and then the, also the educator didn't notice that was happening. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we can do in terms of designing those experiences. If you have students that, that 
or, you know, have that association where they're not going to, you know, you can't just teach to the one grouping and not realize that, that people are coming to these spaces with, with a variety, with a variety of, uh, of, of challenges and considerations. Right. Um, so about designing for, I think where we look to the students who you feel may not be, you may have said in your mind, Hey, they're not into phys ed but really interrogate that to be like, why aren't they into it? Is it not the space? Is it how I've designed it? Uh, is there something else going on beyond? That's not about me at all. It's not about me or the school. It's about something that they are going through. You know, that's, that's acting as a barrier. So I think uh, when we take the students in our approach where we look to who is most marginalized and we try to design for them, hopefully we create spaces that are going to be essential for them that they can participate in your class you know, and, and see their potential. Like I didn't see my ability to want to do physical activity until I was in my twenties where I actually had to unlearn a few things myself. And then I think those spaces will be beneficial for all those, those, those future athletes of yours. Those ones that are going to be leaders will still benefit from that, that, that situation. And I want to <laughs> applaud uh, Jason for that because he took the risk. And I think we want our students to take risks but we need to provide an atmosphere and a culture, uh, like Anne said, and uh, a way for them to do that. And, and I came to HP, HP because I obviously, like Andrea, love sports and, and I was fortunate enough to excel in sport. But at the same time, I had to walk away from that for about 10, 15 years because we're trying to cultivate a relationship that... Um, fosters a love of movement. And my love of movement was tied to the outcome or the, the performance of being a successful high performance athlete. And then I didn't know how to enjoy movement for the fun of that. And that took some time. And where did I find comfort? For me, it was joining, um, you know, rec leagues, queer rec leagues, where there was no expectation. The expectation is you show up and you have some fun and learn some new skills and habits and, and whatever it else, whatever else along the way. And so I'm tying in question two with question one in the, in the sense that I think that was also a framework or a turning point for me was I see parents come and, and question my marking scheme of, well, why doesn't my AAA basketball player son have an A in your class? But does your AAA basketball son understand that there's more to physical and health education other than just putting this ball through the hoop, right? Are they able to relate to other players? Can they be a team player? Um, are they, can they teach in some ways those fundamental skills that they have honed and, and then perform that in a different way and make that the transfer to different sports? Right. So I think for me, that was also uh, the framework of bringing my own experience to it and then looking at the students who, yes, I know that you're going to be successful in this sport, but I want you to have success beyond this sport. And it's not just about the few 2% that are going to make an elite level achievement and then big picture. So treating the whole child, as we say. I see in the chat box, um, Tammy has shared her own experience in HP was saved by um, a particular educator who took the time to notice that something was off for her. And similar to what Jason was sharing, that she didn't really like totally fit in, but then she was able to take the time to shift the environment, but she cared. And then the action of caring right? And, and I connect to Jason's story. He found that connection with movement later on because he found a community. Yes, physical activity and, and um, but the space where he was able to build relationships in a safe environment and, and yourself, D, right? You found your own community where you were able to see yourself. So there's so many parallels in these three stories that I'm just pointing out right now that when you think about this question, what can we do to take the step? Listen, right? And, and, it sounds so simple, but it but it can also be like what Joe was saying, so complex, right? And and when decisions are made, when you're building an environment, like take a step back. Like you don't have to build all your walls right away or, or have everything prepared. Take the time to talk to them. Like think about all of our students who haven't been face-to-face -face for 
probably two years, right? Listen, co-create and build and, and, and create this environment that's going to be different from the last few years so that that one student who hates walking into your class actually wants to walk in your class, right? Like I want my own children to, to love walking into any space in the school, right? And, and I think that's the common theme that I hear from all of us right now. Yeah, and, and and just to wrap up this this portion here, and and you know, yeah. before we start to to talk about student supports, I think what you know, like the the story that that Tammy shared here, um, and also your your recollection, um, D, and the connections, and, and Andrea, the, the the connections that you've made, I think have a lot to do with, and and I talk about this with the teacher candidates and pre service teachers all the time, is what matters to you. And that reflects in your assessment, that reflects in the different classroom management techniques that you use, all of that, all of the different things that you're taught to do in teacher's college. A lot of the times that doesn't matter as much as being present and being with students. Um, and as much as it is important to, to uh, have representation in your curriculum and your media that you use and all of that, that presence that you have to actually see students is even more important than the different things that you're trying to put together and put on on the slideshow, whatever it may be. Um, allowing that space for students to present as they wish to, all of that is is a personal thing, right? It's something that you have to do to relearn, unlearn all of that, so that the so that it comes naturally in what it is that that comes up, right? So listen, care, ask, learn, all those things are just so so important. And then seeing a flood of different. Uh, ideas coming in, in into the chat, including, you know, inspiring, welcoming, and inclusive space. Um, and we've talked about so much about the different hows, um, but it all starts with with us in terms of our learning, right? And, and, and how we're supporting our students in that learning. So looking at the time, it's 1226. Our final question here was what we talked about, I think already a lot. So thinking about the supports that we might need. And I think for all of us here, it really is just this, right? These relationships that we're building right now on this platform and having these conversations, that's really, I think, where a lot of it starts, being able to have someone um, kind of bounce off ideas and, and relate to the different entry points and the different, um, the different stories that we may have and the different uh, and maybe similar upbringing of gender equity and, a different, and, and different connections there. That's really important for us to move forward together. Um, so there, and, and Denise says, as a leader, not putting expectations on students to be best, but to do their best. Um, and you can only know that from getting to know the student, right? So their thank best you, thank you everyone. As, as you get more here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right, just like us, <laughs> think about that, right? Like we, we're giving that patience to ourselves and I hope that you all are. We also have to give the same patience to, to students. Um, I think especially this, this past year, we definitely know that everyone has a lot of um, different things that we don't see. And that's the thing with gender equity, especially, is there are things that we do not see that people are experiencing it. And it is not your right to, to know exactly what it is they're experiencing. And it's their experience. And when they feel comfortable to share and whatever is going on with them, that's their own um, like they have the agency over that, right? They have responsibility over their, their own identity and giving them that space is important. I also made a point um, earlier when we were talking about um, sort of getting to know students at the beginning of the year and sharing pronouns and all that. It's really important that we don't make these types of things mandatory. You can't give a mark, obviously, for sharing your pronoun or not because there are different uh, students that are at different um at, at different times of their their exploration with gender identity um, and all of that. So being mindful about the structures, those are those structures that that we um, uh, that we put in there. Yeah, did I need to know that? <laughs> that, that those are those questions there. Yeah, cool. uh, we have a so couple I just, minutes. But, yeah, I just sorry. So one thing, yeah, like in yeah. terms of collecting information about gender, again, it, 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 you need to have a, like for school boards and and schools, you need to have a valid reason to be able to collect that. And it's not just necessarily for a mark for pronouns. Like often in, a lot of us have used like online forms, making that a required question does the same thing, right? Students will have to put something in that field. So making sure that those questions are just optional as well, if you decide to, to ask them, uh, but have a reason behind it. Um, will you use that information and address students with their preferred, like with their pronouns so that, they, that you're not misgendering them? So I think intentionality behind why you're doing what you're doing, just because we're talking about pronouns now, 
if you're if you're not at that point where you need to still learn about pronouns and how uh, what misgendering means make that your entry point and not just because everybody else is doing it yeah and i think it, you know like similarly to our, our conversation around land acknowledgements and making them meaningful right at the beginning of today thinking about pronoun usage as well is the thing that just kind of rattles off your tongue or do you actually step back and say to students you know the reason why i'm asking for this here is because i believe you know, that gender is a spectrum that you can go on with with what you've learned, right? And and why you care about it versus kind of just having it be something that you kind of just pass through and, you know, you're like, oh, I put it on on this on this getting to know you thing because everybody else is. That's, that's you know, you, you have to think about, you know, why you're doing what you're doing and do you care um, uh, about these issues and why? You have to find your personal why with all of this. So um, looking forward, we start sort of the day kind of looking back, looking forward, there's kind of five different layers to this conversation and the internal conversation that I would say um, it's happened for me and as well through all the themes that we talked about today. So thinking about what perspectives I choose to engage with. And this is where you want to kind of evaluate the people in your life, right? So do I have, who's in my immediate fan group or is it homogenous? Who do I follow on social media? Do I get different perspectives if, if you're if you're on social media? What misconceptions might I have about gender identity, expression, or se or sexual orientation? Um, and that's you know that facing it for all of us a lot of the times is okay. Like this is something that actually I need to unlearn. Identifying those things are really important. What words or strategies might I unlearn and remove from my practices that uphold the gender binary? When someone, and this, the second layer to this is when someone calls me into a conversation to talk about something that may be harmful, how do I react, right? Who am I in that situation? Um, what habits and routines will I create in order to learn continuously and engage with diverse experiences? So the important thing here is, am I just like saying, oh, I'm listening and learning, and then like, I'm just putting it out there and that's quite performative? Or am I actually coming up with habits, routines, things that I do on a daily basis to engage with, with um, diverse experiences? So think about what that could be. Um, am I ready to take action by pushing back on structures and individuals that, that wish to uphold harmful practices in the status quo? That's that courage piece, right? That brave space piece that we need to think about with all of this is, are we ready to have those conversations? Do we feel as if, you know, the kids matter enough for us to put ourselves out there um, and really protect um, their their own um, journeys through their gender identity, whatever it may be that they're going through, right? So five layers there for you to kind of journal about if you want to at some point or, or, or maybe come up with a teacher inquiry. I think Jason mentioned last night when we were chatting, this would be a great jumping off point for all of that. Okay. The last two thing, uh, slides that we'll share with you, this is all going to be um, part of the, the little resource package that we're putting together for you. All the resources that we talked about to get, uh, today and more um, are linked here in the QR codes. And so you'll see everything from the ADL resource um, through to some, some ones that we didn't highlight, but um, I've taken a lot of inspiration from, um, including the Canadian Center for Gender and Sexual Diversity. That's a go-to for me. Um, community, which is in the middle, the big Q. Um, that's uh, the, the the resource and the and the group that I volunteered with growing up, um, and also I attended when I was uh, growing up as a teenager. Uh, so it's a really good place to start there, and they're based in Vancouver. So good resources there, as well as if you are on Instagram, some of you may have be um, connecting with us there. These are six go-to people I would say that talk about gender identity as well as sexual orientation um, and gender equity. These are six great people to learn from. Um, obviously, when you're on their spaces, respect, you know, their time and all of that, um, their DMs or direct messages are usually open, but they also do have guidelines as to how to interact with them online. So do be mindful of that. Okay. So uh, Jason, I think is going to drop a link to the PDF um, of all of this in the chat, or maybe you have already, I'm not sure. Um, but there we go. <laughs> Thank you. It closed thank on you, its own, you. so I'm, I just did a little flourish. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, yes, huge applause. Thank you so, so much, Joe, Jason, Denise, and Andrea. Thank you for um, your expertise, but also for your vulnerability and for sharing, um, you know, some of your lived experiences and, and, and your practice with all of us. And thank you to all the participants as well for sharing and contributing and asking thoughtful questions. Um, I'm always um, amazed and humbled by the community that comes together around the, the topics that we look to discuss. Um, so yes, resources coming. I also just do a quick, quick plug to remind you um, um, that August 30th and 31st, we have two more sessions um, and Christina is putting those in the chat for you now. Um, so we'd be pleased to see you there again uh, to continue uh, the conversation. And I think we'll stay on for a couple minutes if folks want to tap us with, with a couple quick questions. Um, but the formal session of uh, the formal session is over. I'm going to stop the recording, but thank you so much everyone for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>